God, let us enter into God's presence with prayer tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you, we love you, and we look to you now for a special blessing. Speak to us out of your word, Father, and burn us with fire, burn the dross out of our hearts. Father, take out the earwax, and may we hear you, and may we respond to you as a woman responds to her, to her husband. Father, we look to you today. You are the great initiator. You are the great God that plans and executes plans, devises a foresight, and, and can manage all these different seemingly unrelated plans in a way that they all come out in one massive, beautiful, large whole so that the end result is greater than the sum of each part. Father, tonight we look to you again. We love you and we thank you for the gifts that you've given us, for bringing us this far. But Father, we're not content. There is much more for us to experience and for us to know, to learn, to really know you. So much of what we know of you is about you, but so much of you we don't really know. Father, we want to know you. And Father, the only way to know you is to enter in with you into your, into your work and into your heart. Yes. But Father, this is your desire, that your people would enter into your heart through prayer, through study, but through doing your word. Father, forgive us. We come before you, Father. We rend our hearts, we open our hearts, and we admit that we have neglected so much. Father, open our hearts tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I promised that I would share what this what all this means, and I want to do that now. Is this mic? Can I work over here? You got to back. Okay. Now, um, obviously, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go into all the world, and I am with you always. Over here in the small print, it says, Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Over here it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Very familiar passage, uh, Matthew 28. In the big G, you'll see a pie graph. Uh, you've got uh, the 15%. This, this green is up more than 15% of the population is Christian. Okay, so this is considered kind of the Christian countries. And um, over here, you'll see the colors of the world or colors in the world actually match this pie chart. So you can see the distribution of the Christian countries. Now this includes Catholicism as, as Christian. And so that's why you have so much of South America uh, considered Christian. Then the blue here is five to 10%. You can see that scattered throughout the world. Is a very interesting uh, uh, point to make is, is China is actually no longer an unreached country. The house church in China is growing tremendously over the last few years. You can read about that in, in uh, Brother Yoon's book, um, uh, Heavenly Man. And then down here is the 2 to 5%, the yellow, it's hard to read, but anyway, 2 to 5%, you can see Russia and some parts of Africa. And then this big re red region here is the unreached. And you can see that the majority of the unreached is over here in what they kind, kind of call the 1040 window. The majority of the world's population is in this area, and the majority of the unreached population is in this area. So that's kind of what this, this little thing all represents. So what's the 5 to 10 percent? 5 to 10 percent is this blue, the blue stuff. Well, 5 to 10 percent Christian in the, in the population. Yeah, so that's kind of like the emerging church. This is, this is just newly entered, the emerging and kind of the established church countries. Um, now this O here can represent all of Christian giving. In other words, all the giving that is given by Christians in a typical year. 
And this little divot here, this little wedge here, represents how much of that Christian giving is given to reach the unreached. <laughs> so the majority of the Christian giving is, is going to reach Christians already. Um, a small example of that is in North India. This last November, December, we were able to go up to North India and uh, do a two, uh, about four weeks about a four week tour up there and Adel and Jose will be able to share the pictures and the experiences of that but what an incredibly unreached field almost complete neglect I mean 650 million people in the North India Union alone that's double the population, more than double the population of all of North American division. They have 97 pastors. 97 pastors. That's, and what's sad is that the, the church we, has been up there for over 100 years. Yeah. It's just completely neglected. I talked to one of my friends there, Sanjay Singh. He's actually a J Jesus for Asia Bible worker. And he's in charge of 1,300 church members scattered throughout 22 villages, not a single church, much less than half of them have Bibles, and he has five songbooks. And then whatever church group he goes to, he passes out those songbooks, and when he's done, he picks, pulls them back in and goes to the next group. And I says, Sanjay, how do you, what do you do on Sabbath? How do you get to all those? He says, oh, I'm so sorry. I can only get to five or six churches in one Sabbath. He, he, he rides a bicycle. So before he had a bicycle, he could only get to th two or three. But these guys, they'll, they'll ride 30, 40 kilometers in a day to go around and do the visitation and, and build up. And, and, but he's encouraged. I asked him, how do you feel about your work? He says, yeah, God is with me. He's encouraging me. But there's a huge, tremendous field out there. Amen? Yeah. Tremendous field. How in the world is this going to happen? If we look in Matthew 24, many of you are very familiar with Matthew 24, the great statement of Christ about what's going to happen and what's, what it's going to look like in the end time. It says, uh, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you're not frightened or troubled, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. What signifies the end? What is it that Jesus says will bring the end. And the gospel is preached to all the world. Now, I personally believe, come to conviction, that the world will continue to get worse and worse and worse until the gospel is preached to the end of the world, to all, the, all parts of the world. So we see all these wars and rumors and the, and, the, and the stock market falling and all these things happening. We see that the earth is coming to a place where it's no longer going to be able to sustain life, where the lifestyle that we have today is not going to be able to be supported anymore. So what do we do? How in the world are we going to do that? How are we going to, how are we going to make it through the end time? And I get a lot of emails. I don't know if you guys get these emails about what kinds of things you can do to prepare for the end time. <laughs> have, you, have you gotten those? I've gotten a lot of them. Like, uh, uh, you got to stockpile some food. You got to save a little bit of money. Maybe pull some money out of the bank. Um, put some somewhere where 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 it's safe. All these kinds of things. But I want to I want to present to you tonight a different perspective. And I'm hoping that you'll consider this perspective as you plan for the end of the world. How to survive the end of the world. And this was brought to my attention. I want to go through an article written by Ellen White. This was brought to my attention by Brother John Elliott a couple years ago, and it totally blew me away. This is found in early writings, and it's called, it's an article called Duty in View of the Time of Trouble. And she says, the Lord has shown me repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our, our temporal wants in the time of trouble. Really? I was blown away with that because I had always heard that you get a little house in the country and you get a garden 
and you live like a king through the time of trouble, right? But this is saying that it's contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants. What's our temporal wants? Our food, our housing, our clothing, all those things. It is against, it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision, any planning, any provision for ourselves, for our temporal needs or wants in the time of trouble. You're thinking, well, that's crazy. Have you heard that in the church? Have you ever heard that preached? I've never heard that preached. I've heard a lot of, and I've seen a lot of emails recently with the stock market crashing, people saying, you know, it's time to prepare. And the idea of prepare is learn what's edible food. What, what, what can you eat in the wilderness? You know, what kind of food? Get heirloom seeds, all these types of things. But she's saying that it's contrary to the Bible to make plans for, for that, that, specifically that type of thing. Well, let's move on. I saw that if the saints had food laid up by them or in the field in the time of trouble, when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it would be taken from them by violent hands, and strangers would reap their fields. Okay? And what if you had a nice nest egg in the bank? What would happen to that? Gone. Actually, it would just like become worthless. So, um, then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God and he will, what? Sustain us. I saw that our bread and water will be sure at that time. Okay? Notice that he only promises bread and water. Yeah. You ever tried to live for a week on just bread and water? No peanut butter, <laughs> no vaginase, nothing, just bread and water? That's pretty slim pickings. I tried that for a week. I ended up with fruit cocktail and bread, you know, and water. I couldn't handle the bread and water. I got a ways to go. And we shall not lack or suffer hunger, for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. Now, that's an easy statement to read. It's an easy statement to think that's a theory. But is it real for you? That, brothers and sisters, is the test. That's the test that we'll all, we're all going to have to face. You know uh, and you've learned a lot and you've heard a lot about what the final test is going to be, the test of the Sabbath versus the Sunday, right? What's the flip side to that test? That if any man worship not the beast, he cannot buy, buy or sell. See, the heart of the matter is, where is your substance? Where is your sustenance coming from? Is it coming from God or is it coming from the world, from our jobs, from what we can do to provide for ourselves. That's the test, and that's the question. He will sustain us, we shall not lack. If necessary, he would send ravens to feed us. I, heard, I, I, I shared that with one lady, and she's like, ooh, I don't think I want to eat food that was brought to me by a raisin, raven. <laughs> I was thinking, well, she hasn't been hungry, very hungry yet. <laughs> if I get too hungry, I might want to eat the raven. Um, <laughs> Or rain manna from heaven as he did for the Israelites. Now think about it. I mean, God took a million people or more, a couple million people, out into a, an area where there was no food. And you could not grow a garden. I mean, has anybody been to the Negev Desert? There's nothing there. There's nothing there. We, I drove through it in an air-conditioned bus, Mercedes-Benz, in 1984. We were doing 65 miles an hour through this desert, and, and the sand was drifting across the, the road, and... And the bus just move over the other lane, and, and we look out there, and, and somebody planted a garden. There's like little tiny spindly leaves, just barely, I don't know how they survived in pure sand. Middle of the day, people would find any kind of shelter and just kind of, ugh, you know, lay under that shelter, any kind of shade. I mean, it was miserable. But God took a million people into that kind of place that had no possibility of supporting one person. And he, he provided for them for 40 years. God can do the same thing for us today. Houses and lands will be of no use to the saints in the time of trouble. Houses and lands will be, well, where are we supposed to live? Well, that's the question. That's the point. I'll, I'll get to that. Houses and lands will be of no use to the saints in the time of trouble. For they will, so we need to start in our minds realizing that we're not going to be able to be dependent on our comforts, the comforts of home, okay? 
of, of what we own. For they will then have to flee before infuriated mobs, and at that time their possessions cannot be disposed of to advance the cause of present truth. I was shown that it is the will of God. Now, when, whenever it says I was shown, that means that this isn't, you know, some thoughts of hers. This is a direct revelation from the Spirit of God. I was shown that it is the will of God that the saints should cut loose from every encumbrance before the time of trouble comes. Now, what is, okay, what's an encumbrance? Something that's holding you down. But what is, what is she specifically identifying as an encumbrance? What would she identify as an encumbrance? This is very important, okay? I was, okay. Bef okay. And make a covenant with God through sacrifice, okay? So it's something of our possessions, okay? If they have their property on the altar, okay, and earnestly inquire of God for duty, he will teach them when to dispose of these things. All right, so there's a, mer a major paradigm shift that's taking place in my mind. I used to think, and I think a lot of us think, of our house and our property and the things that we own as insurance. <laughs> They're going to carry us through, and that's our, like our safety net, our comfort zone. But what Christ is saying, what, what we're being told here is that, we, that they are not our insurance, they are our encumbrances. They are liabilities. Whoa. What is happening? What, what, why, would, why would the things that give me comfort right now, that, you know, I'm looking forward to going to bed tonight in a nice warm bed. I've slept on bamboo. I've slept on mud floors. I'm looking forward to a nice warm bed. Now, why would that be an encumbrance? Huh? Leverage against, but why, okay, let's read a little bit farther and see if, see if we can figure out her mindset. What's behind, what's the thinking behind these statements? Then they will be free, what? They will be free in the time of trouble and have no clogs to weigh them down. Whoa. Whoa. All right, so I think what she is saying is she is describing not a survival plan. She is describing an exit plan. All right? An exit plan off of this planet. Is this planet is going down. Have you read that anywhere? <laughs> this planet will not last forever. And so what she's looking at is eternal life. And these things that we have, they bar us from seeing eternal life. Now, has anybody seen eternal life? I haven't seen eternal life. But the things that are unseen are eternal. But the things which are seen are temporary. Temporary. But the things which are eternal are unseen. And so what she's saying, I think, is that these things that we have, they draw our hearts. They draw our affections. We have emotions and affections and a great deal of investment in those things. I mean, how many of you have worked to have a place to live? You've invested time and effort and money into those places, the places to live, the car to drive, the things that you have. You've invested time and effort and money into those things. They have a part of our hearts. And what she's saying is we need to disassociate ourselves from where our, well, let's read a little bit farther. I saw that if they, okay, I saw that if, they, if any held on to their property, okay, step one, held on to their property, and step two, this is an incredibly important step, and it ties into a step that she talked about earlier. She mentions, uh, putting their uh, property on the altar and earnestly inquire of God for duty. All right, we're going to talk a, a lot more about earnestly inquire. I saw that if any held on to their property and did not inquire of the Lord, okay, 
as to their duty, he would not make duty known. Whoa. Whoa. Now, I've read, a, I read a, an, an article in an independent um, ministries magazine that was very specifically talking about this subject. And the question, it's kind of a question and answer thing. A uh, very well-known evangelist. And he was asked, is it time for us to sell everything and flee to the mountains? And his answer was, God is able to communicate with us at any time he wants to. You just wait until God communicates you, to you and tells you when to sell your property and then you can go. It's not going to happen that way. If we coast, if we just move through and wait for God to tell us when, he won't tell us. He will not tell us. It says we must earnestly inquire of the Lord for our duty. What does that mean? I mean, Lord, please uh, help me to know when to go. Uh, you know, help me to know when to move into the country. <laughs> Uh, and uh, thank you for the food, amen. Is it like that? I don't think so. I don't think so. There was, when we were um, looking at, at, uh, at starting our ministry, it was 2004, and I had decided that um, after the, I was teaching at PUC, and I had decided that after graduation, uh, we were gonna pack up and we were gonna move to Thailand. And we're going to just jump out by faith. We're just going to go by faith. And God was going to catch us and he was going to take care of us. And my wife totally freaked out. I mean, she started having heart palpitations and dental issues and all kinds of stuff. And, and she was just really uncomfortable with that. And I'm like, why are you uncomfortable with it? She's like, because, and she couldn't really explain it. I says, well, David Gase makes all these crazy decisions and you're okay with that. She says, yeah, but he listens to the Lord. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Okay, all right, so um, we decided not to go at that particular point in time. <laughs> but I decided that I wanted to go, and I started realizing and started reasoning through my motives. You know, we need to look at our motives. We need to analyze and bring our motives into the Lord's light so that he can show up our motives and cleanse our hearts. A lot of times we want to get a job done. He wants to get a character built. <laughs> and so... I started um, analyzing that and I realized half of me just wanted to get out of the job that I was in, do something different. So that half of me, if it was my decision, I knew I would be half unhappy in the place where I went. When I'm fully committed and I know that God wants me to be in a particular place, then I can be fully happy. If I'm 90% sure that's where God wants me to be and 10% sure or thinking that that's what kind of like what I would like to do. In other words, if 10% of my will is involved in that decision, then I'll be 10% unhappy. And that 10% has a tendency to kind of grow. <laughs> kind of like a little tiny burr under the saddle of a horse. You know, a little tiny thing, but it sure makes a big problem. And so I decided, you know, I'm not going to go do anything. I'm not going to make any decision of where we're going to move until I have absolute clarity that this is God's will. And so for six months, I started praying morning, noon, and night. And I started praying morning, noon, and night, every morning. And I would I'd spend, uh, you know, 30 minutes to an hour to two hours begging God to show me what he wanted me to do. Because... I wanted to work for him, but I wanted to make sure that he was calling me. Have you ever had somebody come and, get, and try to get hired at your company and not go through the interview process, just show up one day and says, I'm going to work for you? I think that's sometimes a lot of what we, what we can do. You know, God calls us to work for him, but he would like to be the one that tells us when and where to work. And so I started asking, I said, Lord, I, and so many times I would reason through, okay, this ministry would be so cool, and it would be, do such a good job, and, and man, that would, that would just make a big boost to God's church. So I'm going to go do that. I'm going to ask God. And so I'd be in there, and I'd be praying and asking God, and, and I'd start realizing that, and, and i think, oh, okay, God, I've gotten God's answer by faith. By faith, I've, gotten, I've claimed God's answer to that question. And then I'd start to realize that that was my imagination, you know, that was a pro product of my own thinking. And I says, Lord, I want to have an answer from you, knowing that it's not from my own thinking. Okay? But I, you can't give up. You can't give up in prayer. 
We have not because we ask not, and we, and we give up too easy. You know? God wants us to ask him, but he doesn't always give us, in fact, he rarely gives us the answer right away, because he wants us to go through that refining process of, of prayer and, and coming into communion with him and refining our hearts and our desire and purifying our motives. If we give up, that short circuits that whole process. Okay? Let me, let me back that up again. Coming into prayer, asking God for something, whether it be a direction in life or a purpose or a change or an understanding, if we give up, Without an answer, it short circuits God's process of refining us. Okay? Now, a lot of times we're afraid of, I'm afraid of entering into deep prayer because I'm afraid that, you know, there's some, something bad with me that God's going to expose and it's going to be painful and all that kind of stuff. God's not like that. We think He's like that because we're just that much far, we're just that far away from Him. But when we actually come into that prayer time, into that deep communion time, He treats us in such a, a gentle way that He brings up those issues in a way that you see an open door. So it's redemptive. God has such a deep desire for His church to enter into a prayer relationship with Him because it's in prayer, deep communion, and long prayer that God can come in and work with our hearts and move things, move mountains in our marriage, in our families, in our thinking, in the difficulties. It's in that prayer time that God can come in and do that kind of work. And so here she's saying, if they have their property on the altar, that means in our hearts, placing it in God's hands is saying this is a sacrifice. And earnestly inquiring of God, in other words, entering into a pleading uh, relationship with God, saying, God, what should I do? If we do that, he would make known their duty, and they would be permitted to, oh, oh, wait a minute, I missed, he will teach them when to dispose of these things, okay? So I can't come up here and say, okay, it's all time to sell our houses, <laughs> God forbid, I don't have that kind of wisdom. The beauty of this plan is that God can, if God is in charge of each of our lives, he will manage us so that we are blessed, others are blessed, and we have maximum benefit all the way through the end of time. Amen? See, I don't know when to sell. And if you read this a little bit earlier, it says... Um, it is the will of God that the saints should cut loose from every encumbrance after the time of trouble? Before. Before. Now, do you know when the time of trouble is coming? No. I have no clue. <laughs> God knows. He's the only one that can tell us when to sell. But there's more to it than that. We'll keep going. I saw that if any held on to their property and did not inquire of the Lord as to their duty, he would not make duty known, and they would be permitted to keep their property. And in the time of trouble, it would come up before them like a mountain to crush them. Yeah. Ouch. And they would try to dispose of it, but would not be able. I heard some mourn like this. The cause was languishing. Oh, brothers and sisters, the cause is languishing. God's people were starving for the truth and we made no effort to supply the lack. Now our property is useless. Oh, that we had let it go and laid up treasure in heaven. Okay, treasure on earth, treasure in heaven. Treasure on earth, treasure in heaven. What's the treasure of earth? Houses, lands, witches, money. Treasures of heaven, what? Souls. Souls. That's a... That, that's awesome. Okay. In fact, Luke 16, read about Luke 16, the unjust steward. You know, Jesus says, therefore, use your unrighteous money uh, to make friends so that they, when you, when you run out, when your money ceases, when you cease, they will welcome you into heavenly habitations. Amen? 
There's other friends besides souls saved. It's the angels. You know, the angels are out there ministering, and they're calling us into, their, into co-working together with them. And can you imagine if we've been working with them throughout our life, and then we get to heaven, their response, oh, yeah, hey, come on in, bud. I remember you. Remember when, da, 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 you know? What if we're like, what if we don't join them in their work on this earth? And then we get to the gates, and they're like, you know what? You didn't help me at all. And you want the dessert. <laughs> you think they're going to let us in? I don't think so. The cause was languishing. God's people were starving for the truth, and we made no effort to supply the lack. Now our property is useless. Oh, that we had let it go and laid up treasure in heaven. I saw that a sacrifice did not increase, but it decreased and was consumed. I think what she means there that a sacrifice not given. If we hang on to it, it'll just get smaller and smaller, and it'll just disappear. Um, I also saw that God had not required all of his people to dispose of their property at the same time. But if they desired to be taught, he would teach them in a time of need when to sell and how much to sell. Isn't that beautiful? We shall all be taught of God. If we, if we desire that teaching. Some have been required to dispose of their property in times past to sustain the Advent cause, while others have been permitted to keep theirs until a time of need. Then, as the cause needs it, their duty is to sell. I saw that the message, sell that ye have and give alms, has not been given. I've, 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 I've read this recently in pretty prominent magazines. You need a place to live, you know, don't sell your house. You need a place to live. This is by independent ministries. They're saying, and you know, that, I can't say don't sell your house. I can't say sell your house. I can't say don't sell your house. But I can say ask God. God knows. If it's on the altar, that's the first, that's a major work. It's a major heart work is to put it on the altar. Okay. I saw that the message, sell that ye have and give alms. Give alms is mean give to the poor. Remember what Jesus said to the rich young ruler? Sell what ye have, give to the poor, and ye shall have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Uh, has not been given by some in its clear light, and the object of the words of our Savior has not been clearly presented. The object of selling is not to give those who are able to labor and support themselves. So that's not the purpose of, of selling. We're not looking to support other people, but we are, we, the object is to spread the truth. Spread the truth. It is a sin to support and indulge in idleness, idleness those who are able to labor. Some have been zealous to attend all the meetings, not to glorify God, but for the loaves and fishes. Such would much be, be much better have been at home laboring with their hands the thing that is good to supply the wants of their families and to have something to give to sustain the precious cause of present truth. Now is the time to lay up treasure in heaven and to set our hearts in order, ready for the time of trouble. Those only who have clean hands and pure hearts will stand in that trying time. Now is the time for the law, law of God to be in our minds, foreheads, and written in our hearts. Pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Why would God want us to sell? Why would he develop a plan like this where we would need to let go of our property? Because it seems like such a good plan if we were able to hang on to our property until the very last minute, and then in the time of trouble, our property would be wrenched from us, and then we would go through a short time of trouble, and then the second coming, and we'd be delivered. I mean, isn't that the normal way, kind of the mentality of thinking? As we hang on to what we have, we make it through the time of trouble, and then... The Lord comes and snatches us out. You know? Let's look at a couple of texts. <laughs> let's look at, um, let's go to Matthew 24 again. Okay. Matthew 24, verse 45. This is end time scenario, okay? It says, who then... Okay, you also must be ready, therefore, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful, thoughtful, and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give to the others the food and supplies at the proper time? 
Now, what is give others the food and supplies at the proper time? Isn't that present truth? Okay. Blessed is that servant whom, when his master comes, he will find so doing. So doing. Okay. What is God's... Let's, let's, let's go over to Matthew 25. Now, you know Matthew 25. We start out with the ten virgins, and then we go into the talents, parable of the talents, and then we go to the sheep and goats in the judgment time. Okay? The sheep and goats, remember what Jesus said? Depart from me, I never knew you, for I was unhungered and you did not feed me. I was naked, you did not clothe me, I was hungry. You know, it's that kind of thing. Okay? It has to do with doing something. Now, in the sheep and the goats, the judgment was not based on you didn't understand the, the, the twelfth doctrine of the fundamental beliefs. You didn't say that. That's not what it's about. You didn't understand all these doctrines. You did not minister to me when I was, in, when I was suffering. Therefore, I don't know you. Okay. Now let's go back to um, the second one, the talents. The, talent, the, the Lord placed talents in the hands of his servants and went off to, uh, on a long journey. Okay? He came back and he expected an increase in the talents. The first one, the one that had five, he got another five. And the Lord said, thou, uh, you know, blessed and happy are you, the good, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The one that didn't do anything ended up with damnation. Okay? And so... Um, if we apply that to today, God has given us talents and resources, time, energy, uh, abilities, all these different things. He's given that. Now, if we don't use that, now, does God want more money? <laughs> I mean, what if God gives us, let me say, God gives me $500, and I put it in the bank, and the Lord comes in the second coming, and I say, Lord, here's your $500. <laughs> Or better yet, I invested it. Here's $1,000. You think he'll be happy with me? God has it all already. But what does he not have? Hearts. Hearts. He wants hearts. He gave up gold paved streets to come and find you. To come and find me. He doesn't need any more money. He needs souls. He wants souls. And so this parable is for us to invest our means and times and money to bring souls to Jesus. Jesus to souls. And then the first one is the ten virgins. Remember the ten virgins? Five of them were foolish. They all looked, they, all, they were all virgins. They were all, you know, they looked good, you know. But five of them had the extra oil. Five of them didn't. Now, I always thought the extra oil was the Holy Spirit, and I wasn't really sure about what that was. But if you look, if you apply, if you go to the last parable and work backwards, first of all, the last parable is about visiting the sick, the naked, the poor, the blind, those kinds of things, ministering, doing good works. Um, you apply that to the next one. God gives us the time, talent, and means, and energy, and strength, and hands, and eyes, and mouths, and smiles, and things like that to go and do that work. Okay? And then as we do that work, we're investing those means into souls, which will give us the oil. Amen? Look at this. All power is, is given in, he in, in heaven and earth. Therefore, go, and I am with you always. You notice this statement, I am with you always. What is that contingent upon? Going. Going. Uh, Mrs. White makes a statement. She says, only as the church preaches the gospel and is involved with missions can we expect the power of the Holy Spirit to attend us. She also says that only when the majority of the church is working... Can we expect the latter rain power? Mm. Now, how much of our lives do we spend in God's work 
and compare that to how much of our lives do we spend in taking care of ourselves? Huh? Is that biblical? Let's look in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Let's start with verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for he, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise and be against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is defined as deceitful riches, money, possessions, or whatever is trusted in. Okay? Look at the birds of the air. Verse 26. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, Yet your heavenly Father keeps, them, keeps feeding them. Now, I was, I was always curious about that because I look out there and it's like, okay, I don't see God feeding the birds. I see there's a tree, and a tree makes seeds, and the bird eats the seeds. Okay? So there's a mechanism that we have to, that we have to abide by, right? No. God can use something else to feed those birds if he didn't have trees. You see what I'm saying? Okay. The um, Egyptians worshipped the cows. Now, does anybody here have a temptation to worship a cow? And no temptation there. So why in the world did they worship the cow? Where did they get their... I'm sorry? They thought it was sacred. They thought it was sacred. Why did they think it was sacred? They got their milk from the cow. They got their food from the cow. They got their, their, their clothing from the cow. They got a lot of things from the cow. And so the cow became their provider. The mechanism became the God. See? And that can happen to us also. The mechanism God used to take, uses to take care of us can become our God. Now we look around and we say, okay, I've heard, I hear this all my life. You've got to get a job. You've got to take care of yourself. got to take care of your family. Well, that's one mechanism God can use to teach us and, and to support us. But he has other mechanisms. He has other ways of doing it. As a matter of fact, if he... Sorry? A thousand, a thousand other ways. That's just one. So there's 999... Well, a thousand ways we don't know of. So there's a thousand and one ways that he has. But we say that's the only way. Now, what has God called us to be? A nation of priests. What is the description of the 144,000? They will follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Are we free right now to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes? If not, then what is it that's standing in our way? And that may be our God. Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first a good education so you can get a good job and take care of yourself and take care of your families and put 10% to God's work. Is that what it says? That's not what it says. If we had it right, we have not had it right. And a lot of young people, I'm jealous of the world, brothers and sisters. I'm jealous of the world because I see our young people going into the world and devoting their time, and their energy, talents to get a job to build up the world system. And we've got 40, no, yeah, 40, 45% of the world is unreached. Where is our heart? Where is our treasure? Where our treasure is, there is our heart. If you would, and I hear Sabbath after Sabbath throughout my life, people having a desire to get close to God. And that's good. The best way, the most sure way that you can get close to God is sell all that you have. Give to the poor. Come and follow me. You will have treasure in heaven. 
That's what it's all about. But it's not just selling. It's the work. Christ, was he, when he was here on this earth, was he busy or was he idle? He was busy. He wasn't necessarily busy just because he was doing lots of stuff. Okay? Because we can get busy and not do, any, do anything useful. He was busy. He, was, he, w- he had the life flowing through him. Amen? If we really want to get to know Jesus, we've got to work with him. You know? It's like, if I'm, if I, let's say I'm a ditch digger. I dig ditches eight hours a day, ten hours a day. Now, if my son really wants to get to know me, he's not going to stay at home and wait for me to get home every day. Because his picture of me will be a guy that's dirty in the, mor- in the evening, maybe clean in the morning, dirty in the evening, tired and sweaty all the time, have no clue what I really go through during the day. If he really wants to get to know me, he'll come out, he'll work, he'll dig in a ditch. He'll grab a shovel, maybe a smaller shovel, and start digging. Then he'll get calluses on his hands. Ooh, my daddy must have lots of calluses. You know, Jesus had a lot of calluses on his hands, on his heart. If we want to be like Jesus, we will work as Jesus worked. It takes a great deal of humility, a great deal of humbling ourselves, And Mrs. White, uh, John 15, it says, Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Unless ye abide in me, you can bear no fruit. Mrs. White says, along with the attaching to the vine comes a painful detachment from the world. Brothers and sisters, I'm not here to say, let's find a better way to live. I'm here to say, Let us abandon our human ways of living. Let us seek God. This, I believe, we don't have a whole lot of time left. You know what I'm saying? Not just because the world's going to end, but because God can use other people. Okay? And if he passes us by, let's look at Luke 14. Luke chapter 14. Verse 33. Let's start a little bit earlier. 25, verse 25. Huge crowds were going along with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and likewise his wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. I'm glad he said that, because I can never say that. <laughs> but this, is Jesus, this is Jesus talking. Whosoever, whoever does not persevere and carry his own cross, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. It's not an option. For which of you, wishing to build a farm, does, farm building does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see whether he has sufficient means to finish it? He's, he's asking the question, you guys, if you really want to follow me, you've got to count the cost. You've got to count the cost. This is the cost. What king, going out to engage in conflict with another king, verse 31, will not first sit down and consider and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Verse 33, so then, if in, so then any of you who does not forsake all that he has, 100%, like Brother Ryan was saying this afternoon, God is not looking for 10%. He's not looking for 50%. He's not looking for 90%. He's looking for total surrender. Total surrender. Any of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Wow. You know what the um, paradox to this whole thing is? that in total surrender comes total joy. 
In total surrender is the victory. In total surrender is the joyous Christian life. In a 90% surrender is a miserable life. <laughs> Amen? It's like a guy that's swinging across a canyon. And he gets to the other side, he's like, ooh, I don't want to let go. So he ends up swinging, and he's always hanging there. It's miserable. But suffering is the gateway to joy. Total surrender is the gateway to joy. So what Jesus is asking us for is basically give up everything so that I can give you everything, so that my joy can remain in you. He's not asking us to do something like, okay, kill yourselves for eternity. He's saying, give up the things that keep holding you back. Give up the things that are holding you to this earth that's going to collapse. Give up the things that, that we, it's like, you know, like if a little boy had only a sandbox and a little red matchbox Corvair, Corvette to play with. And he grew up 16 years of his life with just the matchbox. 16th birthday, his father drives up with a red full-size Corvette. Okay? And the father says, I'll trade you. And the boy's like, well, I like this thing. This has been my source of comfort and joy. I've, this, I've had all my fun, all my life. I've had fun with this. What's that do? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And maybe, maybe he's like, okay, all right, I'll try it. So he, he gets in the car, and, and, or he, he looks around, and he gets behind it and starts pushing it like he pushed his old car, you know? <laughs> he's pushed that thing through. Oh, this thing is worthless. <laughs> it's too heavy to push. How am I going to get that in my sandbox? <laughs> God is looking for a complete paradigm shift. Complete paradigm shift to put our sights higher. But we must be sure that we do not accept the gospel for the sake of the benefits of the gospel. Now, first, as young Christians, we may come into that, and Christ attracts us with the benefits of the gospel. But if we stay there, it becomes a selfish thing. It becomes a prosperity gospel. The spirit of the gospel is self-sacrificing love. He who does not take up his cross daily cannot be my disciple. Many of the barren, unworked fields must be entered by beginners. What? The brightness of the Savior's view of the world. I look at this and I get really depressed. I know I, I have like five or six people say, I, I got to slap the flies on that kid's face. <laughs> you know? When I look at the world and the suffering that's in, that sufferings that, that are in the world, it just, it just weighs on my heart. It just depresses me. But when Jesus looks at the world, he, this is a statement, this is amazing, he does not feel any regret for having created man. Wow. And he looks at the world and he is excited because he sees in men and women not people that are oppressed, but he sees the possibilities of what they can become. Can you imagine, what if that little baby, okay, snot running out of his nose, rice on his mouth. Let's say somebody gives him the gospel, and a million years from now, he's the choir leader, and he stands up in front of the Billions and billions of angels and people from unfallen worlds all over the place. And he lifts his arm and starts the choir. How would you feel if you were the one that gave the gospel to that kid? It's a, it's a, many of the barren, unworked fields must be entered by beginners. Okay? Beginners. The brightness of the Savior's view of the world will inspire confidence in many workers who, if they begin in humility and put their hearts into the work, will be found to be the right man for the time and place. God, quali God qualifies the called. He doesn't call the qualified. Okay? Christ sees all the misery and despair of the world, the sight of which would bow down some of our workers of large capabilities with a weight of discouragement so great they would not know how even to begin. 
They would stand above the lower rounds of the ladder saying, come up where we are, but the poor souls do not know where to put their feet. So many of the barren, unworked fields must be entered by you and I, by beginners, beginners, children, children in our hearts. God is so good. Oh man, you know what? I'm amazed because God could, God could, Finish this work with angels. Remember in the Bible text, he says, I will give nations for you. God is letting 100,000 people die without Christ every day because he wants so bad the blessings of taking the gospel to them to be given to his church. There is so much blessings in taking the gospel to his people that don't know it, that God is waiting for his church to do it because he knows there's, there's so much blessings there. The blessings are in becoming like Christ, having a rich experience, having testimonies, and developing a character which will fit heaven's society. That's a whole other topic. We'll get in it. Uh, pray. Pray. This is all about character development. You know, we look at that and we say, we just want to get the job done. But God wants to develop character. He wants to develop His glory in us. And He has given us the job in which to do it. First in our marriages, in our families, and in the world. How can we neglect that job? How can we... Ignore that job. He will not force us. He's not a taskmaster. He gives us a big open door. But we have to push. We have to push. He has shown us his love and he expects an initiative on our, from us. An initiation from us. A response from us. You know, when I started dating my wife, you know, I, I showed her my interest. If she had not responded, I would have lost interest in her pretty quick. Well, I mean, not very quick, but, you know, <laughs> after a while, I would have lost interest in her, okay? But when she initiated an interest back, that's when we began a relationship. Now, God has given us so much. He abandoned the comforts of heaven. To be born in a, in a feed trough, in the mud, and dung, in a very dangerous situation. He put, his, he put himself in, in, in harm's way. He put himself in a bodily dangerous place. If we want to be like him, should we not do what he does? Should we? America... In the North American division, we, me, are almost unfit to take the gospel to the world. We are almost unfit. When I look at going to North India, I'm like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta eat all that oily food. I'm not gonna get any hot showers. It's gonna all be cold showers. And think, okay, and the, and the driving is crazy. You know, it's like, where am I gonna sleep? You see what I'm saying? We are almost unfit. And there may be some some trouble up there, some political turmoils, political unrest. Oh, we can't go now. <laughs> Almost unfit to take the gospel to the world. We've been focusing and, and pursuing comfort, and the world has been dying in misery. That will be the cause of the wrath of the Lamb. You know, we see that as our job to do so that we can go home, but how does Christ see it? Christ sees his own children over there dying, and many times we hardly raise a finger to help. How would you feel if your own child was out freezing in the snow and, pastor, and people were passing him by and didn't stop to help? That's how Christ feels about his children and the way we often treat them or ignore them. Neglect them. You say, you may, we may say, well, that's the other side of the world. 
Not anymore. I mean, right. I can get there in a day. These guys are going to Mongolia. They can, how long does it take you to get there? 24 hours of flight time? It's one day. You can be there in a day. That's your neighbor. That's our neighbor. And wouldn't you denounce those that passed your own child by that was dying in the snow? Wouldn't you denounce them and call them murderers? And your tears would be hot and you would be angry against them? That is the wrath of the Lamb when He comes in the second coming. Wow. I believe it's time to call for a huge rending of our hearts, for a solemn day of fasting, for solemn weeks, personal, family, corporate, of fasting and praying and asking God to take the charge of our lives. To take out the pride, to take out the comfort seeking, to take out the focus on ourselves so that we can become instruments in his hands. 144,000 that follow the lamb whithersoever he went. And the lamb doesn't go in very nice places. He goes down into the slums, the, the slums of, of Bombay, Bombay where how children's houses are built over slum, over sewers. He goes deep into Muslim territory where it's dangerous and you could lose your life just because you're a Christian. Those are the places he goes. That's where the people are. That's where his people are. That's where his children are. I'm going to take a cue from Brother Ryan. I'm going to make a call tonight too. I don't usually do this. I feel the Spirit. There may be one person here that may not come back tomorrow. And I want this call to be, Lord, I, I may not be willing, but I'm willing to, be, to pursue being made willing. Yeah. Not just wait, oh, let go and let God. Okay, God, I'll, I'll just wait here until you make me willing. To pursue God until he makes you willing to initiate an active pursuance of your lover, lover of our souls. If you would like to make that request of God tonight, please stand up and we will pray. Father in heaven, we come before you tonight. Our hearts are broken. We see your call. We've read the challenge that's in the word. And Father, I want to repent. I want to ask and I want to confess all the areas of my life that I have not given to you. Father, the, the self-seeking, the times during the day when I'm looking at my own situation and I'm kind of complaining and all that kind of stuff. Oh, Father, and I look at, at the work that needs to be done out there and I just feel this, this huge tiredness coming over me. Father, I lose sight of you so often. And all I focus on is my own comfort. Father, and we as a church, we as a group of people, we have not done everything that we can. We have not forsaken all. Father, you are asking us to do that and we do want to be there in heaven and we want to have the joy of Jesus in our hearts now. Father, everything that we have, all that we have, we know it's already yours. We put it on the altar and we ask that you will make us willing to enter into that process, to enter into that refining fire, that you will perfect us and you will take us places that we don't even dream of. We love you, Father, and we thank you for loving us first and for sending your Son to die on a cross May we follow Jesus all the way. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Oh, amen. amen.